So, Lone Rider here, and as you might guess from my drawing of Dana Scully, uh, I'm a big X-Files fan. Or, at least I was. So, what I wanted to talk about today was the rise and fall of one of the most iconic uh, shows on American television, and one in many ways that set the stage for a lot of things to follow. Um, I, I don't think you'd be stretching the truth to say that the X-Files single-handedly revitalized interest in science fiction in the United States and around the world, contemporary science fiction, that is. Um, basically, up until that point, all we had had was various retreaded versions of Star Trek. Don't get me wrong, I love Star Trek. Um, but that, I guess, is one of the things that was kind of interesting about the X-Files. Um, most science fiction programs were either space fantasy, like Star Wars, or hard sci-fi, uh, like Star Trek. Um, the, the idea of a science fiction show that wasn't set in the future, in an alternate dimension, or in outer space, but that in fact was set uh, basically in an otherwise normal world, our world. Uh, so, you know, basically, uh, I mean, it was a sci-fi cop drama, more or less. So, you know, you had um, some elements that were definitely uh, seen in uh, hard, what we could call hard science fiction you know, outer space epics and things like, like Star Wars or Star Trek. Uh, well, Star Wars, I guess, is more like space fantasy, but people will argue about that. But uh, definitely, you know, like uh, Star Trek or, um, you know, uh, I don't, you haven't made a movie, but, you know, uh, like the Ledsman series or Skylark in Space um, or Asimov's uh, series of books, uh, you know, Foundation in particular. Um, you know, th these are all typical science fiction and they take place basically in the future in space um Heinlein, same thing uh what do we have here though we have a um a show that's new and original that it's science fiction but it's taking place in an otherwise regular world that you or i would recognize the the present day here on earth or for then it was the present day now it's the past you know, because uh, we're talking about the original nine seasons of the show, and I'll get to why in a second. Um, but yeah, after this uh, show was on the air, you saw a tremendous boost in both police procedurals and in science fiction slash fantasy shows. Um, shows that really took off once the X-Files started to make it big and become a, a thing uh, included, well, I mean, we have Space Above and Beyond, which uh, was actually created by Morgan and Juan of X-Files fame. Uh, this only lasted one season, but it was it was awesome. I, I loved it. I, I miss it dearly. Um, shows like Firefly, another excellent show um, that I, I never actually got to see when it was on the air, but I watched the, the one season that we had of it. Again, it was a show that only lasted one season. But I watched the one season that we had of it, um, you know, uh, after it was long off the air, and um, man, I I must have watched that one season I think like three or four times. <laughs> Just a great show. Um, you know, we had um, shows that uh, Dark Skies was another one that was set during the uh, Kennedy era and the space race, and it involved a sort of X Files ish plot of people trying to cover up uh, alien occurrences. Um, that one was interesting because they mixed in, you know, actual history or, or supposed actual history with, um, you know, that was more of a period sci-fi thing, which is sort of its own genre. But, I mean, it was just, it was a good show, uh, at least the episodes that I saw. I think I only saw, like, the first four episodes, so I don't know what happened to it after that. But um, I remember at the time, uh, you know, watching it as a, as, a, as a teenager, and I thought that was pretty damn cool. Um, shows like uh, NCIS, I think I actually have a DVD here. Ah, the How Appropriate. Uh, one of the catchphrases from that show is never go anywhere without your knife. Here's a knife. Here's, ah, NCIS. There we go. Uh, this was the, uh, the Navy Criminal Investigative Service. So it's basically a, a cop drama, but military cops. And um, that show famously features a lot of forensics and autopsies and stuff like that. Same thing with CSI, same thing with Bones. Um, all of these shows basically wouldn't have taken off or their, their content wouldn't have gone in the direction it went, I don't think, if not for the X-Files. So you've had a rebirth in um, 
science fiction. You had a rebirth in police procedurals uh, due to things like autopsies and forensics being used by Scully in X-Files episodes. You even had what I, I would argue a rebirth in, in some fantasy elements. There were X-Files episodes which dealt with things like Bigfoot, uh, vampires, etc. Um, they usually tended to approach these more traditional monster stories in their own way, um, but they uh, they did tackle those themes. Um, and it was, I don't think, any surprise sometime later when you saw, you know, for example, a television version of uh, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a, you know, <laughs> uh, a sort of notorious uh, 1980s movie that was reborn as a television show after the X-Files had taken off. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and so you have all of these, um, what was the one, Warehouse 13, uh, which was like an Area 51 type thing. Um, I mean, there's a whole, a whole bunch of these just took off across the board because the X-Files popularized these elements. They were always police procedurals on TV. Did they show autopsies? Did they rely as heavily on forensics? Did they have the science talk between the characters that, that the X-Files made well known? Um, whether you're going to, you know, nitpick errors and, you know, there was famously, there was some math, mathematician person who, uh, there was one episode, I want to say the beginning of season two, but I'm not sure, but it was the one with the Strokehold Mining Company, where there was an underground vault with a, with a keypad locked for the door, and one of the uh, bad guys slips a hint to the agents, uh, Mulder and Scully, in this X-Files episode. To the effect, you know, do you know Napier's constant, which apparently is an equation, and that was supposed to be the. It's also known as Euler's number. That was supposed to be the, and I don't remember what it is because I'm not a math guy. I mean, I get up past five, I got to take my shoe, you know, use my other hand, and then when I get up past ten, I got to take my shoes off. But no, seriously, uh, I'm, I'm not one of those math geeks. But um, somebody actually looked at what they were typing in the keypad and said, "Hey, that's not." Napier's cast that you typed in the wrong number. People catch these things. Um, you know, so, I mean, sometimes they don't get all the science talk right, but they did a lot of science talk, and they did a lot of, they touched on a lot of things and a lot of themes that we now take for granted on television, right? Um, one of those was the episodic format. Now, it's a little more spread out in the X-Files. Um, if you go back and you watch the early X-Files, like, let's say, season two, what you find is that they bookended the season. So the first episode and the last episode of each season tended to be what were, what came to be called mythology episodes, episodes that had uh, an overall continuing theme, usually about an alien conspiracy. And um, in between, you had various, uh, what we came to call at the time, Monsters of the Week episodes, um, where you know they were standalone stories, essentially, or sometimes two-parters. Um, occasionally some of those would touch on the same material as the book ending first and last episodes or mythology episodes of the, the season. But, uh, generally speaking, they were freestanding stories, even if they did. Um, so, you know, unlike a show like 24, where every episode goes in sequence and is part of a larger story, uh, it was much more spread out with the X-Files, but they were one of the first people to even do that. OK, even though it was it was much more spread out, the uh, the general format prior to this was a series of TV episodes. Each show would be a standalone story, again, unless it was like a two part or to be continued or something. Um, and what you see with the X-Files is the beginning of that that overarching storyline uh, that, you know, that, that there's one big story that the series is telling. I mean, in a way, uh, a TV series can be looked at kind of like a uh, an album. You know, if I put on, oh, I don't know, Take Your Pick, whatever album. I'm just going to say Billy Joel's Turnstiles because it's one of my favorite albums ever. But, I mean, if you put on an album, generally speaking, if the person who put the album together is any good, there's an overrunning theme through the album, through the songs of the album. But that said, you can also listen to one song on its own and, you know, yada, yada. Uh, generally speaking, TV shows did have an overrun or over running theme and you know the same characters appeared in the show if it wasn't a new cast of characters every week like the twilight zone or something or um outer limits but if it was uh you know if it was 
uh, a regular cast of characters appearing on episodic television, the characters did evolve. You saw them grow. You saw them interact with each other over an extended period of time, but usually in a series of different separate standalone stories. So in that sense, there was, yes, there was a theme to episodic television, but only in the same way as there was a theme to an album. Now, imagine if you had an album where the entire thing was like all the songs were telling one coherent story and it wasn't just a theme, but it was literally, and there are some albums like that. Well, that's what the X-Files was starting. And we wouldn't have had shows like 24 where everything went in sequence. It was literally 24 episodes to one, you know, an hour per day, uh, real time, yada, yada. Um, we wouldn't have had stuff like that if it wasn't for the X-Files. Um, so they, they started that by bookending each season with, uh, mythology episodes that told an overarching story. Uh, but like I said, it was much different than it, than it's done today uh, with other shows. But that's where it began. Um, and there's a lot of things that they really, um, I mean, the, the idea of having the, char the, the, the character, the main characters of the show be, I don't want to say outcast, but be maybe the guy that you know, everybody snickered at in high school because he was sitting in the corner re reading Isaac Asimov or Robert Heinlein, you know, uh, instead of gossiping about what somebody did down at the beach house when they were, you know, crap face drunk. Um, you know, uh, a lot of us who might have been, you know, I, I don't want to say nerds, but who might have had interests that not everybody could relate to, like, um, you know, we were into sci-fi or we were into, you know, I mean... I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, I was reading, you know, everything from George Orwell to Plato's Metaphysics. I probably went through about a book every three days, and um, frankly, I think I learned more from that than I did from my teachers. But um, the point is that the X-Files took that guy and that gal that, you know, everybody might have thought were just a little odd or didn't fit in or, or had, you know, um, well, that, that guy marched to, to the beat of a different drum. Um, and they made those people the focus of the story, the protagonists. So you know, have, you have uh, Mulder, whose views are a little out there, um, so much so that he's described as spooky Mulder by his colleagues. That's not a, a nickname that most people would like to have, I imagine, um, you know, unless you work in a fun house. <laughs> but um, yeah, in all seriousness, I, his, his colleagues thought he was weird. And um, there's actually a famous line in one of the early season episodes where it was Toombs, uh, the episode with Eugene Victor Toombs, where, um, so first season, um, third episode? Yeah, first season, third episode, where uh, um, the, uh, an agent, I want to say Coulson, I'm not sure, he was, a, he was, a, he was the, well, one of the supporting characters, but um, Colton, Colton? I don't know. Anyway, he, he was a he was a jerk who was familiar with Agent Scully, um, but he um, he asked Scully to come in and consult on a weird case where people had been killed and their livers had been removed. And um, so Scully is talking to Mulder at the very beginning of the episode, and Mulder's like, "Well, how come they didn't ask me?" You know, and um, she's like, "Well, they know me from the academy. They probably were just more more comfortable asking me." And when he when he presses the matter, and he's like, "Well, what's wrong with me?" You know, uh, why did they come to both of us? And Scully's like, it probably has something to do with your reputation. And Mulder's like, I have a reputation? And Scully's like, uh, yeah. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was, it was funny. But, uh, uh, you know, he did. He did. People thought he was odd. And then Scully, of course, is a character that probably couldn't have existed prior to the 1990s because of various social changes that were taking place in the country. Um a, a law enforcement officer, you know, a, a medical doctor is not necessarily an untraditional role for a female character, but a, a, a law enforcement officer or investigator certainly is, uh, generally speaking. I mean, even in our enlightened times, uh, you know, in the year 2018, you look at most police departments, for example, and, you know, how many females are there compared to males? And, um, you know, certainly uh, the uh, abilities that go into being an investigator, you know, anybody who's competent and, and, you know, physically capable, so, you know, mentally and physically competent can, can do those tasks. Um, but 
for some reason, uh, either, you know, the way society is set up or um, just uh, sometimes people have other interests. I mean, I'm going to be honest, when I go, you know, uh, uh, you can have female shooters that are just as competent as male shooters, but when I, maybe even more so. But when I go to the shooting range to shoot my bow, nine times out of ten, most of the other people there are guys. So it may just, it may be cultural, it may be social, it may just be some people aren't interested in it for whatever reason. Now, is that learned? Is that a genuine lack of interest in them? Is it a, a role they take on from what they're taught in society? I don't know. All I know is that the idea of a female police officer slash, or FBI agent rather, slash scientist who would actually cut up corpses and examine dead bodies in the early 1990s was fairly groundbreaking, okay? Um, and uh, that's not to say that uh, Agent Scully was not uh, feminine. I mean, she wasn't like, um, you know, G.I. Jane with a shaved head. She didn't look like Sinead O'Connor. She was clearly a uh, attractive young woman, but she also kicked butt. And I thought that was kind of cool. I mean, I'm going to be honest, as a guy watching TV, you know, I mean, it, it's normal. You you look for, uh, you know, interesting characters. And um, one of the things you're going to be looking at is what are the characters of the opposite sex? And if the, you know, only thing you're offered are, are, are you know, airheads and naked boobs, they're not going to be interesting characters. They may fulfill whatever their role is in a particular program, but you're not going to care about them really, right? Whereas somebody like Scully, it's like, wow, okay, I could like, I could care about somebody like that, right? You know, uh, and I can certainly see why Mulder does. And so you you have a character that you can appreciate. And since Mulder was such an iconoclast and was such a, you know, unusual guy going literally to the beat of his own drum in an agency like the FBI, of all things, um, you know, you needed somebody if you were going to have an opposing view, which Scully often represented in the show, you were going to have to have that character be as strong a character as Mulder. So you had to have a strong female character with virtues that stood on, on her own. And uh, it, it, they did. The two characters uh, worked as individuals. They worked as a team. Um, I'm not going to be the first person to remark also that they worked as, um, you know, sort of a, a conglomerate representation of the human psyche. Uh, I think pretty much everybody agrees that Spock and Kirk from Star Trek were the same thing, you know, emotion and reason personified by two particular individuals uh, who could actually have discussions with each other. Um, the, the the same thing certainly was done here. Um, and it's, it, it is interesting, I guess, that Chris Carter, um, you know, uh, was was able to to get the TV people to to agree to something that was at the time you know, it had to be considered controversial, aside from the fact that, in particular, Julie Anderson, the actress that portrayed Scully, was at the time fairly unknown. And I don't think um, uh, uh, Duchovny, David Duchovny, who portrayed Fox Mulder, uh, was all that well known either. In fact, if I remember correctly, he was, I think, an English professor beforehand. So, yeah, the old saying, those who can't teach... Well, those who can't teach, or they join the FBI, right? And that's what Mulder did. He joined the FBI, and um, he was willing to go out there and try and solve all the cases that, you know, everybody just kind of shelved as weird things not worth looking into. And he was like, no, gosh darn it, there's definitely something worth looking into here. And initially, Scully was just along for the ride. If you remember the first episode, she was assigned to the X-Files to basically debunk his work. Um, but the... Uh, the show did turn into essentially a collaborative effort between the two. And it was never really Mulder's show or Scully's show. Um, I, early, early on, I remember The X-Files was one of the very few programs that had a dedicated fan scrutiny on the internet. And I remember actually posting something to a message forum at one point back in the 90s when I was, I think, like 16. And it said something to the effect that, you know, well, Mulder's the driving force in the show because... He's, he's constantly trying to figure out what happened to his sister and uncover these mysteries. And I was right, but I was also incredibly wrong because uh, really the, the way the show worked 
it wasn't about Mulder or about Scully necessarily. It was about both of them. It was about their search for the truth uh, together as a collaborative effort. Um, and um, initially, you know, we are brought to the show through the perspective of Scully because we live in a world where these things are either science fiction or just fantasy, right? I don't know about you. I don't believe in vampires or werewolves or yetis or transmigration of the soul. Uh, to be fair, Mulder doesn't necessarily believe in them either. What he believes in is the extreme possibility that they might exist. But for all intents and purposes, he basically believes in these things, right? We, at least most of us, don't. I don't. So, you know, we come to a show like this uh, from the perspective of the real world, and we're entering it through Skelly's eyes. Um, but the the interplay between the agents and how they, how they hashed out that search for the truth, that was really what the X-Files was about. And, um, you know, as far as themes and episodes, they tackled all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, you had a hard science fiction. Uh, there was an episode that dealt with the issue of determinism that was presented through the artifice of a time travel story. Um, you dealt, you, you had, um, you know, more classic sci-fi fare like alien abductions. Uh, you had a lot of times straight up police stories that just involved, you know, uh, kidnappings or murders or some other mystery. Um, and, uh, you know, then you had, and this didn't start initially, but eventually you started to have occasional humorous episodes brought in. The first of which I think was the episode Humbug, where they investigated a murder that occurred in a town populated by circus sideshow freaks. Yes, it's as funny as it sounds. Okay. Um, but the, uh, you know, they really, they told a variety of different stories uh, they had good characters to walk us through the stories and to introduce us to them. And the, you know, the characters, like I said, were people you could really get into and care about. And the, the, the thing was just well done, you know, uh, when they did the first feature film in, I want to say 97, but it might've been 98. They, you know, I wasn't surprised that they did a movie, um, because they were doing movie quality special effects and, and writing every night. Yes, there were some scenes where you're like, oh, the acting isn't all that great, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, they were bringing in a lot of people, you know, for bit parts. And, you know, there's only so many people who can play, let's say, a dwarf, for example, et cetera. But um, the, at the end of the day, they did really good stuff and they put a lot of really good work into all the episodes. Were there some episodes where you're like, yeah, that was kind of a lame idea or that, that one kind of sucked? Yeah. But, you know, if a show's been on the air for nine years, for basically a decade, and the worst you can say is that they had a few episodes that weren't all that great or that were derivative, excellent. All right. And, um, in fact, the episode with Eugene Victor Toombs from season one, well, there were actually two episodes because they, they actually did a, a follow-up episode. It wasn't a direct sequel. Um, but... Uh, the first episode with Eugene Victor Toombs, so the third episode from season one, they really put a lot of work into that one. I mean, they didn't even show the murder in the first, in the first, you know, in the in the, in the opening scene. There's usually either a crime discovered or you see one get committed uh, before the agents are called in. In this particular case, you didn't actually see it. The guy who, who gets killed goes into his office after getting a cup of coffee, and you hear a struggle, and then something splinters the door from the inside. But you never actually see him get killed. And then when it's cameras panning around the room, you you see the dead body only in reflection in items that are on the table, like a glass paperweight, things like that. You never actually see the body directly. And then the camera pans up to the wall and you see a vent being pulled closed, but you never actually see who's escaping through who or what is escaping through the vent. So um, you know, they kept you in suspense and they kept it kind of classy. They didn't just show blood and gore everywhere. Now, I don't know how much of that was, you know, they were trying not to scare the, you know, the TV people who had to approve the episode, uh, you know, with, with the first few episodes of the, the very first season by, by being too gruesome. So I don't know, maybe they were required to present it a little more tastefully in, in order to, to get it to pass. This was 20 odd years ago, so we could show and tell what, what, you, what it was acceptable to show on television was a little different than now. On the other hand... Um, it really helped tighten the suspense and it really helped keep you. I mean, can you imagine if they had just straight up shown you who the killer was and, and what he was doing? Um, and even in the second murder, you know, you see, you see the guy who's by that point, you know, who it's halfway through the episode, you know who the murderer is, but you still don't quite know how he does it. 
Um, it's revealed at the end when you see Ethan Katorda's body. There's a scene where he jumps out of a vent like a python. But um, uh, the second murder, there's a guy trying to light a fire in his fireplace, and the killer comes and grabs him, and you 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 hear a, a, a shout, and you see a struggle, and he pulls him out of frame, and then the camera goes over to the fireplace, and you see the fire that he was starting to light uh, using newspapers as kindling. The embers of the newspapers die out as the shouting dies out. So, you know, like life is symbolically extinguished as the flame goes out. You don't actually see the killing, in other words. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, truth to the, the, the idea that I, I've heard batted around ever since I first read, you know, Macbeth when I was in school. And, you know, well, how, how come you never actually see the murder? Why don't you, you know, the, 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 uh, the killer goes into the room with the knife, comes out, the knife blade, blade is bloody. You never see the king get killed in Macbeth, in Shakespeare's Macbeth. How come? Part of it might have been, well, how do you show that without somebody actually getting stabbed? They didn't have great special, stage special effects in Elizabethan periods. But part of it may also have been, you know, it's a lot scarier if you just let your mind imagine it than try to show it. It's a lot scarier if you leave it up to the audience to put their own fears and their own, you know, whatever in there. And um, it's just more suspenseful, I think, um, scarier or otherwise. So, you know, they really put a lot of work into, you know, you're halfway through the episode before you know who the killer is. And you never really see him killed. And even when you figure out how he does it, there's still this big reveal in the end where you actually see him do it completely. Uh, and it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, and, and at that point, it's the conclusion of the episode. The bad guy's getting busted. They're wrapping it up. So the they really put a lot into drawing out the suspense, into making you want to see what happens next. Um, and they really put a lot of work into it. Now, contrast that with what happens in... The new X-Files. And by new X-Files, I mean the 2016 attempted comeback, because I didn't even see the one from this year. I, uh, I refused to see it. They tried to bring it back with a six-episode miniseries. Now, there were a lot of things wrong with this. The acting was wooden. The writing was worse than some fan fiction I've seen done by 12-year-olds. And, and frankly, you know, there's no excuse for any of this, given that they had all this time since the series went off the air to come up with new ideas. And a lot of the original people, including Chris Carter, came back to the project. Um, they open the very first new episode with the monster walking around. I think in that particular episode it was an alien, but the monster walking around in plain view in, in broad daylight. And it just looks so fake. I mean, you can tell it's a dude in a rubber suit. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, what, one of the things that made the X-Files so great is that they really worked hard to dole out that suspense. Everything fit together. The character interaction, the writing, the, the, the pacing, etc. You show the monster in the beginning, you show the killer in the beginning, whatever. There's no fracking suspense, okay? Uh, add in the, the wooden acting, the, the bad writing, the fact that the characters were out of character, the fact that none of the story ideas were really all that original, except maybe for the so-called terrorism episode. Um, the, the general... Uh, thing they did was they just rehashed a bunch of old ideas, but in doing so, they broke continuity, and they did it worse than they did in the original series. If you're going to rehash ideas, it really only helps to do that if you're going to do it better. You know, it's like retaking a test. Oh, I got an 85, I want to get a 95, I'll retake the test. If your score is 76, it doesn't help you, okay? And, and you know, 76 would be would be being generous. The, the new X-Files sucked. It was abominable. It was awful. It was like, that's six hours of my life. I'm never getting back. And there's some things you just cannot unsee. Okay. Um, I didn't even bother to watch the, the new one. Uh, but if you go back to the original series, it was awesome. It was wonderful. It was new. It was fresh. It was, it was great. Admittedly, the earlier episodes were the better ones. I think once they moved to California, they lost something of the spirit of the thing. Um, the first season in California after the movie wasn't all that bad, but towards the end, it, it did get kind of derivative. But you know, ultimately, if you look at the first nine seasons, the vast majority of the episodes were really damn good. And if you look at the first and second seasons in particular, awesome, standout, 
rock solid X Files. Okay. So, uh, you know, this was a show that was a cultural icon here in the United States, and I got it on the ground floor. I started watching it my uh, first or second year of high school, something like that, during the first season. Right? Um, and uh, I honestly, I wish, um, you know, they hadn't tried to bring it back. Um, you know, sometimes you got to look at it and say, you know, overall, am I adding to the effect and to the appreciation of the work, or am I diminishing it? Um, I guess you could make an analogy to a, a sports hero or, or boxer or, or anybody who, who you know, doesn't quit at their prime, right? The X Files should have quit at its prime. At the very least, it should have quit after the season finale, the series finale of season nine, to bring it back for a tenth and then however many other seasons. Um, you know. It's like one of those zombie stories, which I guess is, is a fitting comparison for a show that sometimes delved into the, the frightening. Um, I don't know what they brought back, but it wasn't the X-Files. They brought back a monster, okay? And the, the ironic thing is that all the people that were involved in the original X-Files were involved in this. So why did they flood it so bad? I, I honestly don't know. Maybe we could do an X-File on that. Maybe it's a conspiracy to discredit the old show. Maybe they were like, you know, hey, let's let's somehow, you know, maybe, you know, um, Chris Carter had like some kind of about face uh, where he just, you know, totally became a different person and was like, you know what, I hate all my old work. I'm going to destroy it. The best way to do that is discredit it going forward by making crappy shows. I honestly don't know. Um, it could be an X-File. That's how bizarre it is. But this is the danger of what happens when you try to just keep milking something for money, when you when you try to bring something back and then take it beyond where it can go. Um, you know, uh, The X-Files was a great TV program. And, you know, for me, the attempts to bring it back haven't ruined that. But they've ruined the overall franchise. My timeline, as far as I'm concerned, stops at the end of season nine. The second film the 2016 six-episode miniseries, and whatever that gosh-awful thing was that they did this past year, as far as I'm concerned, they never happened. The X-Files ended at the end of season nine. Because um, I don't know what that other stuff is, but it's not it's not the X-Files. To quote a line from uh, one of the very good episodes that they did make after the move to California... Um, early in that season. I think it was the episode of Dreamland, um, which was a two-parter. Uh, as Frohickey from The Lone Gunman said in that episode, who are you, you punk ass, and what have you done with Mulder? Well, I would say, excuse my French, who are you, you punk ass, and what have you done with the X-Files? Because this isn't the X-Files. So you want the X-Files, go on Netflix, go online, Buy the DVDs, you know, I'd say go to Blockbuster, but they don't exist anymore. Uh, but, you know, get your hands on the original X-Files. Um, I'm old enough, I actually still have the VHS tapes I taped off TV, but, you know, it's it's way cooler to just, to just buy, pop one of these in and watch it. Um, so, you know, the X-Files was and is a great TV program. It still holds up. Um, I don't know why they felt the need to try and update it, the, you know, the stories and themes about, you know, truth, justice, um, you know, government accountability. These are all themes that are timeless. They were relevant in 1993. They were relevant in 2003. They'll be relevant in 2063. Um, it was never not relevant. I mean, Mulder's famous line at the end of uh, season one episode, um, I think it was in the season one episode, Fallen Angel, where he says, you know, and no one, no government agency has jurisdiction over the truth. Hello? I mean, <laughs> that was true back then. It was true 20 years beforehand. It'll be too tw true 20 years from now. There was nothing about the X-Files that needed to be updated or, or rebooted, but uh, for some reason they felt compelled to not only try and continue to extend the story past when it, where it should have gone and to places it shouldn't have gone, but they um, they also felt compelled to try and update it and make it more 
current. And that was a mistake. The X-Files was never not current. The X-Files was never not relevant. And, um, you know, watch the old episodes. Yeah, you're going to see a bunch of old cars and people wearing out-of-style fashions. But basically, the stories are as relevant now as they were then. They still hold up. The characters are great. And uh, you'll have a grand old time. All right. Watch one of these, and you'll know what everybody was talking about. As far as the new stuff, just don't bother, okay? You know, uh, you're better off, you know, you want to see some weird stuff, turn on the news, okay? You're better off doing that than trying to watch one of the new episodes of The X-Files. Um, so anything after season nine, but uh, the original nine seasons, definitely, and especially the first and second seasons, I highly recommend them. So just my two cents, the, uh, the rise and fall of, uh, what I would consider an American television icon and um, definitely still worth watching today. Just ignore the new crap. Mm. Bone Rider out.